Father Stefano Gobi was an extraordinary mystic who died in the year 2011. He was a Catholic priest and a theologian. He was the founder of the worldwide and amazingly fruitful Marian movement of priests, and he received private revelations from Our Lady from 1972 to 1997, messages that are compiled in what has become known as the Blue Book. Here it is. The whole thing you can find posted for free. Link in the description. Some critics of Father Gobi, however, say that his prophecies failed and that we should therefore leave him aside because the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary did not come by the year 2000. On the other hand, some of his supporters say that the explanation is simply that the prayers of the faithful mitigated the events and the time of mercy was extended. Still others, they say, that the triumph did come by that point, but it was a subtle and interior thing, which we could observe in various signs that did already, in fact, transpire by that point. Now, I'm a big believer in Father Gobi, but what I'd like to provide here is yet another explanation, the one that I favor, the reason I still believe that the prophecies are authentic. I don't absolutely reject those who say that the explanation is that the time of mercy was simply delayed. That's always possible. In fact, this isn't an ad hoc thing. Our Lady herself said to Father Gobi in a message from the 1980s, well before the, the 2000 benchmark, that the delays were always possible, that, you know, don't... I don't have it in front of me, but she said something to the effect of don't lament, don't don't complain if, if these chastisements don't happen. You know, don't be like Jonah with Nineveh because God can and does delay and mitigate the events. But anyway, that, so that's a possible explanation. But what I believe, what I suspect, is that the prophecies Father Gobi received, they are absolutely authentic. I, I more than suspect that. But I think that they will be fulfilled without delay but in accordance with the wording Our Lady actually used. Not with how the prophecies were most popularly interpreted, even interpreted by Father Gobi himself. I simply don't think that Our Lady was referring to the triumph happening by the year 2000. I believe she was referring to the triumph happening, triumph happening by another year, a year still in the future, but very soon. And that's the case I want to present to you in this video. For you to discern as you please. This is not a prediction or a prophecy of my own. I'm putting this out for out here for you to discern. Okay, before I get to that, though, we need to take some time to talk about Father Gobi's authenticity, because as with all the valid authentic prophets, prophets he's attacked by the uh, people we can only uh, refer to as the spiritual offspring of the Pharisees within the Catholic Church. There's a couple of things that the run-of-the-mill, low-information, professional careerist Catholic laymen and women attend to attack him and focus on. Let's briefly address them now before we get into the point of this video. First, if you look this up, you'll find this supposed, quote, advice from the secretary of the CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, saying that Father Gobi, again, quote, shouldn't claim that the messages he received are from the Virgin Mary, but rather they are, but rather that they are his own personal meditation. Now, this advice itself was relayed as hearsay. We have no documentation. No one who claims that the documentation exists can actually present it. <laughs> the few websites, if you if you research this, as I have many times, the few websites that claim to present this, they have links. Some uh, one, at least one of them has a link, and the link doesn't work. So it, who knows if it ever worked? It's to it's to a site that doesn't actually have any documentation. Now, the hearsay itself. It's from the former Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, Archbishop Katia Villan. And I'll just take note here that Archbishop Katia Villan, he's the one we have to thank for uh, ex-Cardinal McCarrick's rise to power. He tried to cover up other cases of abuse by powerful churchmen, including Cardinal Law. Cardinal O'Connor opposed this, but Katia Villan, had, had, he had McCarrick promoted anyway, and the rest is history. So we're playing telephone here with this supposed CDF opinion about Father Gobi, an opinion on advice on, you know, this whole telephone game. And as usual with the attacks on the authentic seers, these supposed pronouncements against them simply don't exist. Father Gobi was never condemned. There was never any declaration whatsoever, not even implicitly, not even a little bit, that these messages were not from Our Lady. Not even close. Don't believe anyone who says otherwise. More importantly, Father Gobi himself, he always maintained, until his death, with absolute conviction, that these messages were revelations from the Queen of Heaven. Now, he, he conceded 
and no doubt in contradiction to his conscience and adding that that little note into his book that they're presented as meditation short but he always maintained these are revelations now i'll add here personally that it's not surprising to see certain church officials advising against any form of promoting private revelations Private revelations, they often save and sanctify countless souls, but they also, in so doing, always cause headaches for certain church bureaucrats. And the last thing that these certain church bureaucrats, I'm of course not condemning all of them here, I'm referring to a, a group of them, these certain bureaucrats and cassocks, even with red hats, the last thing that they want is a headache. And remember, yet again, we have nothing in writing, and even this, even all this hearsay was decades ago. Cardinal Bertone, who was the CDF uh, prefect at the time, he could have at any point said that he didn't believe Father Gobi's revelations were authentic. Even if he did say that, it still would have been just his personal opinion unless he rendered an official decree. But he never even did that. It still hasn't happened. And Cardinal Bertone, as of me saying this in 2023, he's still alive. And speaking of which, remember, Father Gobi died over a decade ago. His legacy of holiness and orthodoxy and spiritual fruitfulness, all the norms that the church gives us for discerning private revelations, all of that has only grown since then. Nothing has ever come out that has put any of it into question. So, you know what? He's authentic. Period. Now, I'm not claiming that I have certainty here. It's not like St. Faustina or Servant of God, Luisa Picaretta or Blessed Conchita. We can be absolutely certain in their authenticity. Just peruse the other videos that I have on this channel and you'll see why that's the case. But even if I'm not claiming absolute certainty in the supernatural origin of Father Gobi's messages, I am claiming solid conviction in them. Great conviction. I want to show here a quick clip from my cousin-in-law, uh, Dr. Mike Cirilla. He's a theology professor at Franciscan University at Steubenville. He's interviewing Bishop Athanasius Snyder here. Uh, Dr. Cirilla, by the way, he's not only a relative and a friend, he's also an excellent theologian, and I highly recommend his works. I also want to add that this group that he started, that this video is a part of, uh, he started along with another person, but it's the Confraternity of Our Lady of Fatima. He started it in 2020 to encourage Catholics to pray for the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I joined it right away. And also for the consecration of Russia. Two years later, March 25th, 2022, Pope Francis consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart as Our Lady requested of Fatima. The first time any pope actually consecrated Russia by name in union with the world's bishops. So, despite Pope Francis's flaws, which we won't get into today here, this was the most faithful consecration yet by any pope in response to Our Lady's request of Fatima. Perhaps we have uh, Dr. Cirillo's group to thank for that in part. Anyway, here's the here, here's the clip. Father Gobi, he was supported by many bishops and faithful bishops and pious bishops uh, during his life, and many devoted and faithful priests also in it it bore fruits i mean of priest priestly fidelity and even the lay people the cynical groups of prayers prayer and also the uh, father gobi he helped also to pro promote a greater devotion to our lady of fatima for example to the immaculate heart and his admonition. As Bishop Snyder says, look at the fruits. Now, I don't want to misrepresent the good bishop. He also basically said in that video that he doesn't claim to know Father Gobi's messages are supernatural. He simply points out the me that the messages are fruitful and orthodox, and he thereby implies it would be foolish to dismiss them. And I agree with the good bishop. As I also said, I'm not claiming to know, but I can tell you that they are 100% orthodox. They are completely in line with Catholic teachings. His revelations, Father Gobi's revelations, they're endorsed by countless cardinals and bishops, including Pope St. John Paul II himself. They have borne such superabundant good fruits that this could only possibly be the work of God, the action of the Holy Spirit. Three separate cardinals even bestowed their own imprimaturs to his revelations. One of them not only bestowed the imprimatur, but, but effusively prayed. You know, it wasn't a reluctant imprimatur saying, okay, fine, I don't like this, but it's, but it's, it's orthodox. No, they, they effusive praise for it, saying this is, uh, I, I heartily recommend this. As, uh, anyway, this, this is a sure sign of, at the very minimum, 
I mean, yeah, if you're serious about this, it's a sign of their authenticity. But at the very minimum, this is a sure sign of the doctrinal orthodoxy of Father Gobi's revelations. But Father Gobi's critics, absurdly, they all claim that his messages are unorthodox, not only inauthentic, but also unorthodox. Now, this is flatly rejected by the church through these imprimaturs. These laymen and laywomen with no mandate They've appointed themselves inquisitors. They do this to many other seers as well. They've appropriated for themselves the right to pass judgment, judgment that is reserved to the competent ecclesial authorities. They claim that they know better than these theologian cardinals. They want us to believe that they know better than the literally hundreds of bishops who are or were formerly a part of Father Gobi's movement and support his revelations. And by saying or were, I don't mean like, they abandoned him or something. I'm talking about, obviously, many have died since then. I don't know of any who have come out to condemn this. So we've got hundreds who supported it, who were formally incorporated within it, hundreds of bishops even. None have done anything but maintain their support. Now, these, these self-appointed lay inquisitors, they want us to regard their personal opinions and their own clueless interpretations of a few small verses in the Catechism as more authoritative than multiple extremely high-level ecclesial approbations. But let's get to the details. Why is it that they say this? Why is it that these critics condemn Father Gobi's messages as unorthodox? Well, the reason is simple. As usual, with certain, as I said earlier, low-information professional Catholic laity who despise private revelation, they have absolutely no idea what church teaching on millenarianism is. They think you're a millenarian heretic if you believe in the era of peace that Our Lady promised of Fatima as absolute, the triumph of her Immaculate Heart. They believe you're a millenarian heretic if you believe of, in a coming of Christ in grace. Not a physical coming, that would be millenarianism. Father Gobi never said that, none of the seers say that. They think you're a millenarian heretic if you believe in a spiritual, an outpouring of grace from the Holy Spirit, a coming of Christ in grace. Or if you believe that the Our Father means what it says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, or if you agree with the entire consensus of all Catholic prophecy for 2,000 years, the old Catholic encyclopedia in 1914, summarizing all prophecy, it says all the seers agree. I don't have it in front of me, but it says all the seers agree in a triumph, in a triumph of the church, a renovation of the world, an era of peace more splendid than ever seen before in history. That's the Catholic Encyclopedia summarizing all of Catholic prophecy. So these self-appointed inquisitor lay men and women, uh, you know, career lay apologists maybe, they, they, they want you to reject all of that because of their personal opinion, their interpretation of a verse or two in the Catechism. And I absolutely, I, as, you, as you know if you've seen any of my other videos, I absolutely in, uh, advocate for full submission to all the Catechism. But they're misinterpreting a couple of verses, and they didn't even check the footnotes, by the way. They think you're a millenarian heretic if you believe, if you simply submit to the entire consensus of 20th century papal magisterium, repeatedly, pope after pope after pope after pope, for at least 120 years or so, repeatedly saying that the, the kingdom of Christ will come more fully on earth, the triumph of Jesus, the triumph of the divine will, the era of peace, so many other ways they've referred to it. Anyway, getting... Uh, getting distracted here but I so I don't I don't want to make this video too long so I can't go into this in too much detail here if you want to see why their attacks are so unbelievably erroneous I mean it's already disputed by the mere uh, fact that they are contradicting the authority of the church in its endorsement of the orthodoxy of Father Gobi's revelations but if you want to know the details of why and I think you should it's very important that you do because these attacks will only continue I'm sure See, please see uh, my book, Thy Will Be Done. You'll find a, a relatively brief, but also quite uh, detailed explanation of how this is founded absolutely in the in Scripture, in the Fathers of the Church, in the Magisterium, in all approved prophecy, and that it's 100% orthodox and 100% certain. Or if you don't want to look at that book, Thy Will Be Done, check out the videos on this channel. This Right in this channel, DSD O'Connor, it's other playlists, you'll see at least one video about the coming of the kingdom of God on earth. And that'll lay out the, the uh, essence of it as well for you. So, the era of peace, which is indeed the reign of the divine will on earth, a more full coming of the kingdom of God than has ever been seen since the fall, that's coming. It's not heaven, it's not the beatific vision, 
We don't get Jesus phys physically, visibly until we get there. Of course not. And we don't get any of the benefits of the beatific vision until we're in heaven. But of course, his will can reign on earth. He wouldn't have taught us to pray the Our Father to petition for that very request if it was impossible, which is what these, these critics of Father Gobi seem to think, that Jesus was a liar in the most important thing he ever said, the climax of the one and only prayer he ever taught, the Our Father, that was a lie or a pipe dream. So, I mean, and I'm not, claim, I'm not claiming they are blasphemers explicitly. They, maybe they mean well. I hope they mean well. But it's like if you actually think about it, that's blasphemy. If you actually think about what what's entailed in that accusation against our Lord. Okay. This is orthodox. It's not only orthodox. Just as importantly, it's a guarantee. I can tell you that with absolute certainty. The kingdom of God is about to come more fully on earth than ever before in history. In the glorious era of peace, which is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which is the reign of the divine will on earth as in heaven, the fulfillment of the Our Father prayer, the Eucharistic reign of Jesus, before his full visible reign in heaven. I could, uh, and I plan to make many videos about um, the details of what's coming soon. So please subscribe to this channel, click subscribe. Don't forget to click you know, notifications. My wife told me recently she wasn't, I, I, I don't know when you're getting videos up. I'm like, no, I'm subscribed, but I, you got to click subscribe and then like receive notifications after you click subscribe. Anyway, back to the topic of this video. Father Gobi is authentic. His messages are from the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we better take the actual wording that Our Lady used with them very seriously. In fact, we should take that much more seriously than even Father Gobi's own personal and fallible opinion on how they should be interpreted. What I'm going to present to you now is an argument for your consideration, disagree with it if you like, no harm done, for your consideration that what Our Lady actually said to Father Gobi does not align with what the common opinion was on what she happened to mean. Now, I'm not accusing Father Gobi or the early followers of his movement of any wrongdoing here. Uh, the, the mistake, that mistake in interpretation, it was all part of God's permissive will. He let it be that way for a very important reason, as he often does. He did the same thing in sacred scripture itself. Look at the very last verses of the gospel. The gospel of John chapter 21. Uh, it's, it says, Peter turned and saw the disciple following whom Jesus loved. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, What if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? You follow me. So the word spread among the brothers that the disciple would not die. But Jesus had not told him that he would not die. Just, quote, What if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? Okay, let's end the quote. There's a couple more verses until the end of the gospel, but that's what I want to focus on here. So, Obviously, if any prophecy is valid, and many, and it is indeed, Scripture would be, above all, the supreme prophecy. It's public revelation. And even public revelation's prophecy is sometimes deliberately obscure from the beginning. We can't possibly accuse Scripture of having problems with it. It's, it's inerrant. It's infallible and inerrant. God knows that it sometimes won't, that prophecy sometimes won't be properly interpreted, correctly interpreted at first. He lets it be that way. For a good cause. Now that gospel, that gospel I just, that passage I just read to you from the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John was written decades after Jesus died. Who knows how long that rumor was circulating before a more careful consideration of what Jesus actually said revealed otherwise. These rumors about how to interpret a prophecy often need to be revisited, and that's what I'm doing here. Think also about the secrets of Fatima. Our Lady told the children, and this is in the second secret, the war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. Now, she said that during World War I. Obviously, she was referring to World War II breaking out later if people did not repent. Well, m people did not repent and World War II happened. But Pope Pius XI died February 10th, 1939. So that's, that's also when his pontificate ended. World War II did not formally start until September of that year, seven months later. Now that fact is undisputed and it is undisputable. 
Am I thereby claiming that the Fatima prophecy was a failed prophecy? Of course not. Fatima is as authentic as they come. The point is just that anyone alive in March 1939, they would have said, well, we don't have another world war. We, we don't have the papacy of Pius XI any longer, so I guess that must have been a failed prophecy. They'd be wrong, of course. World War II already had, quote, broken out. But it wasn't formal yet. It wasn't known yet. It was all hidden. Now, this wasn't an issue in 1939 because the Fatima secrets were not released at that point. But the fact remains that the prophecy itself would have initially appeared at variance with actual events. But that appearance would only have been based upon an interpretation of the prophecy. An interpretation that says that war, quote, breaking out, must have meant that it had to be officially declared with widespread battles and mass casualties, the likes of which we hadn't seen since World War I, etc. Now that interpretation would have been flawed. World War II was in fact already essentially breaking out during the papacy of Pius XI. People in general just didn't know that yet. Until Germany invaded Poland in September of 1939, that's when everyone knew that the world, that the world was at war again. Another war had started. So much for World War I, the Great War being the last war. Anyway, uh, this, that relates very much to today as well. But this is all to say that what I'm doing here with Father Gobi's prophecies, taking a closer look at the actual wording to see what they really are referring to, even if that contradicts how they've generally been taken, this isn't some ad hoc approach to try to rewrite the history relevant to the prophecy. Instead, no, this is what we must always do with prophecy. Consider it more carefully, what it actually says. Some people regard Father Gobi's prophecies as failed, as I said in the beginning of the video. Here, we're now getting to the real crux of the matter. Some people regard them as failed on account of what did not happen by the year 2000 AD, when that is compared to what is stated in his locution, uh, I think it's number 532, on December 5th, 1994. Now, I really can't lend any credence to the view that says this prophecy was fulfilled in the year 2000. It was just all quiet and subtle with like the canonizations of just, of, uh, I, don't, I don't know. But anyway, there's a number of theories. I just, I can't give them any credence. No, the, the, here's the truth. No one alive will, will miss the triumph when it comes. I mean, and this fact is made repeatedly clear even in Father Gobi's own messages. They refer to it as almost a restoration of Eden across earth the fulfillment of the Our Father prayer, the divine will reigning on earth as in heaven. So, quite the contrary, I believe that the clear sense of the prophecy remains literally true, but it's been both, bo both misinterpreted and mistranslated. Father Gobi's locutions were received and recorded in his native Italian, but the English translation generally cited of message 532 states, I confirm to you that by the great jubilee of the year 2000, there will take place the triumph of my immaculate heart, of which I foretold you at Fatima, and this will come to pass with the return of Jesus in glory to establish his reign in the world. And I'll just add here, Father Gobi's messages repeatedly in other places make it clear that this is not a return of glory in his phys physically, that's only at the end of time. Father Gobi absolutely acknowledges that, as do his messages. But anyway, looking at the original Italian of what I just read, the original Italian does not say, by the year 2000. That's the quote I just read says that, the common English translation. Here's what the actual Ital original Italian says. And I'm sure I will botch this Italian pronunciation, but here we go. Te confermo che per il grande jubileo de due mia avera il trionfo del mio cuero immacolato. Nowhere is the Italian of the word year, anno, included in the message. All it says is duemia, which simply means 2000. It does not necessarily mean the year 2000. It can be understood in Italian, and it can validly be translated into English as referring to the year 2000, but it does not have to be. All this prophecy necessarily refers to is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart taking place by, quote, the great 2000th Jubilee. So if you actually look at what Our Lady is saying there, what she specifically clearly said, 
you are immediately confronted with a question. The great 2000th Jubilee of what? Well, this message was given in the 1990s, so everyone had in mind the great jubilee of the year 2000 AD. In other words, the 2000th jubilee of the birth of Christ. Even Father Gobi himself had this interpretation in mind, so his followers certainly also did. That's why there was nothing to prevent the translation of his messages referring to the year 2000, even though there was no need to include the word year in the translation. In, uh, in August of 1999, Father Gobi actually wrote that Our Lady impresses her spirit within her little children. This is where the Immaculate Heart triumphs. For now, she keeps it hidden. When the time will come, and for me it is the great jubilee of the year 2000, she will lift her mantle. That's what Father Gobi wrote in 1999. So in other words, that it will be visibly manifest in the world by the year 2000. That was Father Gobi's own take. But he says right there in his note that he himself wrote that it is only his personal understanding. He said, for me, it is the year 2000. He doesn't say that that's exactly what Our Lady said, that it would happen by the year 2000, when the time will come. Okay, so we, we've got to understand here, this is fairly straightforward, but people tend to forget it. A seer's own interpretation of the messages he received, they're not on par with the messages themselves. If a seer is going to put something out there as words from heaven, then anyone has the right to take an objective look at the words themselves and come to a different conclusion regarding their proper understanding, and I suspect that the great 2000th Jubilee was not intended by Our Lady as a reference to the year 2000, but rather to the 2000th Jubilee of the Resurrection, the 2000th Jubilee of Redemption, the 2000th Jubilee of the Birth of the Church. In other words, I believe that Our Lady told Father Gobi that the triumph of her Immaculate Heart entailing the coming of Christ in grace, the era of peace, and all that that entails. I believe that Our Lady told Father Gobi that that would transpire by the year 2033 A.D., not 2000 A.D. Not necessarily during the year 2033, could be earlier, but by that year. Remember, Our Lady said in the message that I just read earlier, by the 2000th Jubilee, by that time. Now, there's, so let's leave that, let's really carefully, let's remember that. But there's another enigmatic passage we have to deal with when we're considering the timing of Father Gobi's prophecies. That is message number 389 on September 18th, 1988. And here's what Our Lady said to Father Gobi in 1988. She said, On this day, I am asking you to consecrate to me all the time that still separates you from the end of this century of yours period, space, new paragraph. Then she says, it is a period of 10 years. These are 10 very important years. Okay, full stop. I can see, I can, I admit the immediate and easiest interpretation of this is pretty simple. That the 10 years that Our Lady just referred to started that day when the message was given. Because before referring to 10 years, she implored consecrating the time remaining in the century to her. So it's, it just kind of makes immediate sense that she's just talking about the same thing in those adjacent paragraphs there in the message as it's recorded in the Blue Book. So understandably, people assumed that she was talking about the same thing. You know, that those 10 years were right then. But uh, we have to pause to ask the obvious question here. How much time was remaining in that century? In the first paragraph, she says, consecrate the time remaining in the century to me. And then she's talking about a period of 10 years. How much time was remaining in the century when she gave that message? When she said the time that still separates you from the end of this century of yours. Was it 10 years? No, it was 13 years. The message was given in 1988. The 21st century started January 1st, 2001. No, not January 1st, 2000. I know <laughs> you're thinking. Uh, many people don't count centuries correctly, but Our Lady does. There's no year zero. The first year was year one. So the, two th so the year 2000 was the last year of the 20th century. Look it up yourself if you don't believe me. 1988 to 2000 to the end of 2000, that's 13 distinct years in the calendar. Or if you want to be more mathematical and precise, it's 4,488 days 
from the date that message was given to, as Our Lady said, the end of this century of yours. So in terms of fractional years, that's 12.3 years. Now, I know what the critics are saying. Oh, 13, 12.3, that's basically 10 years. Clearly that message, those the 10 years referred to in that message were just the 10 years immediately thereafter, you know, about the 10 years immediately thereafter, 1988 to 2000. I respond to that, no way. Our Lady would not round 13 or 12 down to 10. Doesn't make sense. First of all, it's inaccurate. Secondly, 12 is more symbolically meaningful than 10, theologically, eschatologically. If she meant 12, that's what she would have said. She didn't. She said 10. So just like the message about the great 2000th Jubilee that we talked about a couple minutes ago, I believe we have to look at what was actually said, what we can definitively take from the wording itself. And in this case, we see two exhortations in the message. First, consecrate to me, to Our Lady is saying, consecrate to me all the time that still separates you from the end of this century of yours. That is 1988 to 2000. Second, separate exhortation. She says, be aware, and I'm paraphrasing it. This is, my, this is how I say we should understand. This is how I'm proposing that we should understand it. The second exhortation in that message is, be aware that during a yet-to-come period of 10 years, all the following events will transpire. And then she gives a list of things that will happen during this enigmatic span of 10 years. She gives actually five specific things that will happen. First, she says the time prophesied at La Salette and all the upper ash, uh, other apparitions, but she only singles out La Salette. The time prophesied at La Salette and elsewhere would come, uh, w w the fullness of it would come. Uh, she says the culmination of purification would come. She also says the time of the great tribulation would come. She says the mystery of iniquity, prepared for by the spread of apostasy, will become manifest. So the manifestation of the mystery of iniquity. And, and then the fifth thing she says, that in general, just all the secrets revealed by her, wherever, on any authentic apparition, will take place regarding these times, of course. Plenty of, plenty of things she said, apparitions have already happened. But the best bet we have, considering what she said there, what we've just considered in the last couple of minutes, is to try and ascertain when this period of 10 years started. I think the best bet we have is to look at the first of those five prophecies. She said that the completion of the fullness, that those are the direct quotes she used, the completion of the fullness that she spoke of at La Salette. Now, this is, this is where it gets really interesting. I didn't think I'd stumble upon any of this when I really started diving into this, but here's, here's, how, here's what happened with my research. Um, so because La Salette's the only other specific apparition she mentions there, that, I think that's, that's a clue. We really need to focus on that. She's telling us, I think she's hinting at us, what specifics we are supposed to look into in order to determine when this 10 years might just have started. Now, I'll, just a quick note on La Salette. I'm no expert in this. Uh, I'm, let me absolutely throw that out there right now. I'm not, I'm not an expert in La Salette. But I understand, I'm told, that there are a bunch of extra prophecies added later on well after the church's approval of La Salette, and those later prophecies are suspect. And I admit that I've seen some things attributed to La Salette that don't seem to line up with what has been said in countless other uh, definitely authentic prophecies. So there were all sorts of crazy circumstances. I don't want to go into them now for the sake of time. But the point is, what we should really do here is stick to the ver If we want to be really, you know, take Our Lady's cue to Father Gobi and just try and figure out when this period of 10 years starts, let's take a look at the version of the La Salette secrets that were submitted to the bishop by the girls, uh, Melanie and Maximin. Let's take a look at Maximin specifically. And this is where it gets really fascinating. I'm, uh, I'm drawing from Miracle Hunter, the website Miracle Hunter, great website made by Michael O'Neill. He just lays it all out for them, like all ton countless apparitions, which ones are approved, condemned, no decision, or non-constat. And by the way, a non-constat is not a condemnation. See my blog, dsdoconnor.com, for more details on that. I digress. Uh, but anyway, here's what the Blessed Virgin told the seer at La Salette Maximin. The faith will die out in France. Three quarters of France will not practice religion anymore, or almost no more. The other part will practice it without really practicing it. Before that arrives great disorders in the church and everywhere. Then our Holy Father, the Pope, will be persecuted. His successor will be a pontiff that nobody expects. Okay. 
Our Lady here also said that this will, quote, arrive by the year 2000. That's, that's a very interesting thing here. We're dealing with the year 2000 again here. But at La Salette, Our Lady just said these things would arrive by the year 2000. And I think that's pretty obvious that this, these disorders did arrive before then, certainly. But to Father Gobi, Our Lady says that these same events will reach the fullness of their completion in the years we're in now, in this mysterious, this enigmatic 10 years. This is amazing. That, that a La Salette, she's directing us to La Salette. And what do we see in La Salette? We see that the times, these times are rising by the year 2000. And what do we see in Gobi? We see Our Lady saying that during a yet to come 10 years, the fullness of the completion of these events will happen. Everything is lining up here in an extraordinary way. Okay, so what was prophesied by Our Lady at La Salette certainly arrived by the year 2000, and we haven't seen their completion yet, that's coming. But what we did see is a completion of two specific items in that prophecy, looking at the La Salette prophecy. And I think that is the clue that Our Lady is deliberately giving us through Father Gobi to ascertain the time she's referring to. Two extremely specific things in that message to La Salette. Three quarters of France not practicing religion, and before that, before that hallmark, before that benchmark is passed, the Holy Father being persecuted and his successor being a pontiff that nobody expects. That is exactly what we saw with Pope Benedict. I can't, you can't you just look it up and you'll find countless articles in the Catholic blogosphere talking about how he was so severely persecuted for his orthodoxy. That great God rest his soul, and I'm sure he's in heaven, but Pope Benedict is so holy, so orthodox, but so severely persecuted that he felt the need to, even, to resign the papacy itself because of that, because of how much he had to suffer for that. And then what happened? Then came Francis. I don't think I need to remind anybody here, wherever you fall in the spectrum of views on him, that no one expected him to be Pope, and no one anticipated the pontificate that we've had these last 10 years. Uh, that, uh, as Our Lady said, a lost let, that no one would enter, no one would expect this. But Our Lady here says at La Salette that this change, and that obviously that was 2013, Benedict, and then to Francis, which no one expected, the, that pontificate. So that was 2013, but she said that would be before the other things prophesied. Although that itself would be after the disorder entering the church and the world. That, of course, was before... Uh, 2000. We could pin that to plenty of time. I mean, disorder's always been in the world, but it reached this this demonic level, especially throughout the uh, the postmodern and postmodern West throughout the 60s, uh, the latter half of the 20th century, especially. Clearly, the arrival of that was then. But the prophecy about France that comes after the three quarters of France thing. Just look at the details of the last let message again. That comes after this pontiff change. Okay, so it's, she's saying it's after 2013. Here we have to look at data. France, as I think most of you probably know, has abysmal, horrendous church attendance. I, if I understand correctly, only about 2% less. I think I saw even like one point something percent of Catholics actually attend Sunday Mass there. Basically negligible. I'm not saying you don't, if you're a weekly mass attendee in France, I'm not saying you don't matter. I'm just saying quantitatively, the number is almost negligible in France. But the prophecy isn't talking about weekly mass attendance. It's not talking about diligent, you know, full-blown, uh, diligent, rule -abi norm-abiding atten mass attendance. It's just talking about practicing religion at all. The prophecy says that three-quarters of France will not practice religion. And let's just be honest here. When Our Lady is referring to religion at La Salette, she's referring to the true religion. She's not being some synchristic heretic saying, you know, saying, oh yeah, if, as long as you practice Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism, you're practicing religion. No, she's talking about Catholicism. But she, she says only three quarters will practice it at all, uh, will practice it. And the other, the, the remaining quarter, will practice it without really practicing it. So we already know that the amount of people really practicing religion, Catholicism, in France is essentially negligible, as we just said. The question then that we have is, when did France pass this level of having a full three-quarters of people not practice religion at all? I have been doing tons of research to try and figure out a good answer to this question. It's very difficult to ascertain. France doesn't seem to have, as far as I can find, the detailed data from various polls and surveys and mass attendance that we 
that I can at least more easily get here about mass attendance in America. But I did finally come across one study. It polled almost a thousand people in the year 2017. And the question this study asked just happened to be the ideal one to determine how many people at least practice religion, Catholic, the Catholicism, Catholic, the, the true religion, who at least practice it at all. The question was this, do you plan to go to Mass on Christmas Eve? If there's any hint of religious practice left in a member of the faithful, they'll at least go to Mass on Christmas. Now, I know you're, what you're thinking, wait, what do you mean Christmas Eve? Like, what about Christmas Day? You got to understand, like the pollsters who, <laughs> who did this survey, they knew what they were doing. Traditionally in France, the, the mass, the Christmas mass time is Christmas Eve. So if you're, if you're a Frenchman and you're asked, are you going to go to mass Christmas Eve? You understand that's simply asking, like, are you going to go to mass this Christmas? That's, that, that's what the question means. They, they knew what they were doing. So I was able to, um, I was able to access the results of this survey, thankfully, with my academic account. And guess what the results were? 80% of the respondents said no. They were not even going to attend Christmas Mass. That's roughly three quarters. And it happened in 2017. Okay, a couple quick things here. Mass attendance has, of course, been steadily dropping in France. So we can infer that these things were progressively, progressively better each year we look further back so that they only now got this bad. I'm, you know, I'm just saying we can't argue that this happened many years before 2017, probably. Um, this is new. The other thing, though, is that we can't, we can't definitively claim that all 80% of those uh, people don't practice religion. And of course, this poll itself, we can't be sure how representative, how representative it is of the overall population. I'm sure there's a good amount of that 80% who do practice, but for one valid reason or another, weren't attending Christmas Mass that year. So we may well have hit the three-quarters mark prophesied a loss a little after 2017. Now, I understand, obviously, I concede this is not precise. This isn't anything but a precise science. But my point is just that it does lend some credibility to the thesis that Father Gobi's 10 years to triumph started recently. There's clear indications here from Our Lady to Father Gobi. We're still supposed to look at La Salette to take a look at, the, to ascertain the the placement of this 10 years. And we see right there in La Salette two extremely specific clues as to when it might have started, and both of them were recent. That's amazing. That That's really something. All right, but even that is only one possibility for when this 10 years might have started. Let's consider some other possibilities. I see two other big ones beside 2017. First, 2020. Remember, Our Lady told Father Gobi in that enigmatic 10 years the culmination of the purification would come. I believe that the COVID tyranny of 2020 was the opening act of the purification. I can't go into detail here on this platform for why I believe that's so, so please see my blog for more information on that. You'll find a link in the description. Please also subscribe there at dsdoconnor.com with your email address. I've got many more things I'd like to say soon of this nature that I can only post there on my blog my email blog subscribers that I can't post here, so please subscribe there. Anyway, long story short, what happened in 2020 has never once come even close to happening in the entire history of the church. The universal suspension of the public sacrifice of the mass in spring 2020, absolutely unprecedented. I've often said that I, I believe that that's, this opened a spiritual black hole in the, fab, the ontological fabric of the universe. I'm not trying to get sci-fi on you here. I'm obviously speaking metaphorically, but I believe that was the beginning of the era of explicit express purification because we're so short-sighted, we human beings, aren't we? So worldly. We think of chastisement and purification merely as things that, that, that bring about physical pain, physical destruction, and sure, that's going to be part of it. But the greatest chastisement, definitionally, is the deprivation of the greatest good. The greatest good is the Eucharist. And they took that from us. The secular authorities demanded it. Sometimes they only had to request it politely. And the church caved almost universally, including at the very highest levels, in stark violation of their divine mandate directly from Christ himself. So I see a very strong argument that Father Gobi's 10 years to the triumph are the years 2020 to 2030. Third possibility, 2023. In other words, right now. Unfortunately, it looks like World War III is about to start. 
I hope and above all, I pray that this doesn't wind up turning into a full-blown nuclear war. As I said, chastisements, you know, I noted our, how Our Lady had said to Father Gobi that chastisements can always be mitigated up until they've happened. So we should relentlessly fast and pray for peace, never become fatalists, never become defeatists. Please do everything you can with your works, of, your works of mercy, spiritual works of mercy, especially to avert this. But at the same time, we shouldn't bury our heads in the sand. It's been almost a year now, as I'm saying this, since the Russian-Ukrainian war started. Every single solitary development since then has only hurtled us closer and closer to this becoming explicitly World War III. And yet, because it was almost a year ago, people just tuned it out, as is, as is to be expected unfortunately, of, uh, of worldly people who have no interest in the signs of the times, no interest in heeding uh, heaven's words. But anyway, I say explicitly, World War III it seems to be explicitly coming on the horizon because implicitly it's already started. Pope Francis has stated this repeatedly in recent months, and I think he's correct. Now, if this does become an explicit Third World War, that's obviously... The, the purification culminating. A, thir a third world war, the, the first world war since the dissemination of nuclear weapons, I mean, that's a purification if there ever was one. And if that does wind up happening, World War Three explicitly breaking out, becoming nuclear war, looks like it'll, it may very well be this year. Pray that it won't be so, I hope that it won't be so, but it's looking... Not unlikely that that'll be this year. So if somehow 2020 doesn't qualify as the beginning of the purification, I think it does. But if somehow it doesn't, 2023 certainly would if that winds up happening. If this winds up being the, war, the year of World War III. So there we have it. However you slice it, I believe that it is clear that we are on the path right now to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary within the next decade, if not sooner. I'm not issuing a prophecy of my own here. I'm not even issuing a prediction of my own here. I'm speculating. As I said in the beginning, I'm just presenting this as a possibility for your discernment. It's not absolute. The important thing is that we know with absolute certainty that this is coming soon. Whatever heaven chooses to mean by soon, which is for God to know for sure, not us. But I believe that God wills to give us enough hints like this one that we've discussed here today, to keep us on our toes, to keep us zealous in undertaking the mission, the mission that is the salvation and sanctification of souls. That's the entire purpose of all eschatological speculation of this sort. It's not for its own sake. It's not to help you guide your investments or some stupid thing like that. The only purpose of these eschatological speculations is to inspire you. To inspire you to be more zealous in doing what you should already be doing anyway. So whether you agree with anything I've said in this video or not, who, at the end of the day, who cares? Because this is the exhortation I want to leave you with. Proclaim the divine mercy. Proclaim the divine will with more zeal than ever before. Because the time for doing so, the time of mercy, the window of opportunity we have is quickly running out. And if we don't use this window to build up treasures in heaven... We'll have to answer for that negligence on Judgment Day. Pray. Become a saint. Save souls. Trust in the divine mercy. Proclaim the divine mercy. Strive to live in the divine will. Proclaim the divine will. Proclaim the kingdom. Tell everybody that Jesus is coming soon, but he wants us to trust him first. Get the divine mercy image everywhere. Tell everybody that the Our Father means exactly what it says. It's about to be fulfilled if we do our part. You do these things, your reward will be great in heaven. But also you may well see the reign of the divine will on earth with your own eyes, the same eyes you're using right now. And you may well raise your own children during the glorious era of peace. The Blessed Virgin Mary told Father Stefano Gobi, in the hour of the great trial, paradise will be joined to earth until the moment when the luminous door will be opened to cause to descend upon the world the glorious presence of Christ, who will restore his reign, in which the divine will shall be accomplished in a perfect manner, as in heaven, so also on earth. 
The new era, which I announce to you, coincides with the complete fulfillment of the divine will, so that at last there is coming that about which Jesus taught you to ask for from the Heavenly Father. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the time when the divine will of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is being accomplished by the creatures. From the perfect fulfillment of the divine will, the whole world is becoming renewed because God finds there, as it were, his new Garden of Eden, where he can dwell in loving companionship with his creatures. I have chosen you and prepared you for the triumph of my Immaculate Heart in the world, and these are the years when I will bring my plan to completion. It will be a cause of amazement even to the angels of God, a joy to the saints in heaven, a consolation and great comfort for all the just on earth, mercy and salvation for a great number of my straying children, a severe and definitive condemnation of Satan and his many followers. In fact, at the very moment when Satan will be enthroned as Lord of the world and will think himself now the sure victor, I myself will snatch the prey from his hands as if by magic he will find himself empty-handed. And in the end, the victory will be exclusively my son's and mine. This will be the triumph of my Immaculate Heart.